I think everybody, everybody has a calling. Circumstances led me here. After almost 13 years at Biomoran, through, through a lot of great and difficult times, it was like, well, this might be the right time to sit down with JJ. And I did. And I said, you know, I think I'm going to call it. I realized that he had a lot of institutional knowledge and that if we did not capture all this, a lot of this history would be lost. And he offered up, he said, I want you to write the history of Biomarin. Would you be interested in that? I mean, like, hell yeah was the answer. <laughs> and there are a lot of reasons why Biomarin should not be around today. That's what's interesting, I think, about this story is how is it able to take those experiences and really turn them around and grow into such a success? Well, at the time, in 1991, I needed a project that looked meaningful as a fellow. I had to do something that was going to make a mark and become a career. That project turned out to be developing an enzyme therapy for MPS1. Dr. Neufeld at UCLA had just cloned the gene and been working in that disease for 30 years. He came and talked to me and he said he really wanted to do gene therapy. And she said, no, don't do gene therapy. Everybody else is trying to do it. And she said, I want to do enzyme therapy. Finally, we have a chance. You could really do something for this disease. And I guess I was able to convince him, and you know, the rest is history. Because it doesn't really matter how sexy science is, if you're able to treat someone successfully, that means more than anything. It really was in the presence of greatness. Liz, she literally created the science around lysosomal storage disease. She was conservative and thoughtful and deep, and I was maybe bolder and brasher and <laughs> driving ahead. The combination of the two, I think, was important at making a project that seemed totally impossible actually succeed. In 1991, I was working at Harbor UCLA, and it used to be a hospital built in the Quonset Hunts, these World War II era bungalows. If you could imagine going to summer camp, that's kind of what they looked like. They were old military barracks. You'd hope that it hadn't rained because then the front lab would be musty smelling. There were stories of skunks that ran into bungalows and sprayed investigators. So though they were ugly on the outside, they gave us the freedom to do what we needed to do. Yeah, there's definitely a little cowboy mentality going on there. It's like we're out of here in the Wild West. It generates a can-do attitude. Emil Kakis, he created the first therapy for MPS disorders in that bungalow. Now, in the early days, did not have much money. We were scraping. I was getting used equipment. My father-in-law was helping. It was all kind of a homemade operation. We were told in September of 1991 that Ryan would pass away by the time he was 10 or 12 and he would be in a lot of pain. It was really not until 1994 that I met Ryan Dant and his parents, Mark Dant and Gene Dant, where it became real, it became personal. It became about a kid who was dying and that really changed everything. Because of Emil's work, changed the world for children, not only with MPS-1, but other MPSs and other lysosomal storage disorders. But it really took Biomarin to come in at that moment to bring the money required to actually make this thing get to the next level. I'd like to start with John Clock and Chris Starr and I in a Mexican restaurant on Grant Street in Novato. And I said, what we really have to do is take this technology and if you want people to believe in it, we have to found a new company with a new face and a new image. So we took a video of the first patient and the investors, they got emotional. <laughs> every, time I, every time I showed the film, I cried, you know? <laughs> and the investors cried and they wrote checks. I get emotional because I love these kids. Forgive me for that. There clearly is a huge emotional connection to the nature of the work that we do. And as scientists, there's a dispassionate search for the truth. And one of the great things about Biomarin is both of those ideas can come together. The first year was a very crazy year for us. So when we got to go, which was March 97, 
I knew I had to run and get to the clinic as fast as possible. What I saw was suddenly a lot of activity at Amos, and you know, he was now able to buy equipment and you could see progress. We had a lab built by June. I treated our first patient in December of 97. So it was about nine months from company formation to first patient treated. We had no idea in our wildest dreams that we could reverse the course of the diseases in any of these patients. So in the early period, it was really Grant and his business acumen from his prior years that put Biomarin on the map. So that really set the stage. Sometimes I felt like a one-armed paper hanger with the hives, trying to keep everything rolling. I was the chief cheerleader and fundraiser. You know, in one sense, I was Mr. Biomarin because I wore the Biomarin logo on all four cheeks. The camaraderie again and the, the laughs we had and the enjoyment. It was one of the best times of my life in my working career, I can say that without question of a doubt. The people that were here um, from early on and then through the tough years, we weren't here for a paycheck. We were here to help these kids out. I'm at the company about a month and I go to an FDA meeting. One of our reviewers turns to me and he says, I expect you to be the conscience of the company. And I now understand a little bit better what my role at the company is. It's about creating the culture of which we do the right things the right way at the right time. We were partnered with Genzyme. Genzyme wanted us to be a satellite. And the biggest battles we had in negotiating the joint venture were about manufacturing. Get in a conference room and they say, we're moving manufacturing. But with a little Brooklyn bravado, I just tell Genzyme, we're gonna leave it at Biomarin. Robert Baffert got it done. Had I not been here, they would have transferred manufacturing. It would have been a disaster. And Biomarin probably would not be here in the same capacity as it is today. I got pulled into Elder's and as things heated up, that's when things really got pretty crazy. Literally was all hands on deck, and, and those that couldn't sustain um, didn't make it. This has to get approved, or we were pretty much closing shop. And it was do or die for Biomarin to get that thing approved. And Aldurazem was the first real treatment for any of those MPS disorders. And now, less than 15 years later, you go to an MPS conference, and almost all the MPSs have treatments. My vision was always about multiple product approvals, building the infrastructure, and bringing the expertise. Robert's been at Biomarin 16 years, plus or minus, and he came here with a lot of experience. I remember my first day. I had my first meeting with my boss, Bill Anderson, and he says, I uh, just want you to know that FDA is coming in 17 days. And so I literally went around asking questions like, can you build a chain link fence over here and can you get it done in 17 days? Robert Baffey. He tells it like it is and he, and he tells it like he sees it. He came in with really valuable information and knowledge and brought a level of maturity to the quality systems here. When I first came here, we made some very on purpose decisions about how do we bring core capabilities around manufacturing that allows us to control our own destiny. Robert was responsible for literally creating the technical operations organization. Most of it was in Galley when I started. Uh, it used to be just a parking lot, a warehouse. It was all Aldorazim all the time. When we thought about our Galley expansion, it was really built in anticipation and reaction to, we have new products and new capacity, so what can we do? And I've been at the company over 16 years. That building's been under construction of one sort or another almost for the entire time. We have optimized Galley for making seven different products right now using three different types of technology. So I interviewed with Robert Baffey in uh, 2003. He told me we focus on the signs. And it's really that focus on the signs that makes us successful with our first pass approvals. When we put a plan together, we have a tremendous track record. Literally, each facility change we make being approved on a first pass basis. Most companies would be very lucky to have that track record. I think I'd actually sent in my resignation. Someone by the name of Robert Baffey got wind of this. And the next minute, he's in my cubicle. What are you doing? Where are you going? Why are you doing that? That was my first experience of someone, especially in Robert Baffey's capacity, recognizing some lab rat to keep them and to inspire them, and which was amazing. Again, no one has ever done that.
And Robert was really the glue and the soul of keeping Biomarin's spirit alive. Matt Patterson, you know, when Matt and I had dinner and we reminisced about the old days, he said, you know, I think Robert could be the most important hire that Biomarin ever made. Grant left. Fred Price became the second CEO. Fred's piece in the whole story was to really take Biomarin and make it legitimate. He did put the company on a solid footing to establish its own manufacturing operations, put in place a product development team. He raised a lot of money for the company at a time when we're going through a lot of cash. Fred Price had a reputation for being aggressive. He felt free to express his frustrations in a loud voice. I knew there was gonna be some pain and suffering involved. <laughs> he's an imposing guy. I mean, physically, he's very tall. And I'm, I'm not very tall, so most people are physically imposing to me. He's got really long fingers, and he'd like to shake them at you. <laughs> I think it was really Aldurazyme that set the initial direction for the company developing pharmaceuticals. Fred felt under a lot of pressure to create something that was a little bit bigger and more substantial opportunity for the company. He was always having some notion that the orphan diseases were not sufficient to, to build a company around. We started to move from our core expertise, you know, therapeutic enzymes, into other areas. The first time I met Fred, he was really thrilled and pumped about how he had just gone out and met with a lot of investors. And at the time, he was really pushing a new product we had called Neutralase. And he was so proud, you know, knowing the high-tech business that we're in, he had described it as our killer app. And I submit to you, if you're a pharmaceutical company, killer app isn't really a term you want to be using. He had this whole concept that he was trying to analogize to the tech companies who could have this, this runaway trajectory without really thinking about all the hard work and science that goes into to drug development. Neutralase was a cardiovascular drug. We did not have a lot of cardiovascular experience. It failed fairly abruptly in the early part of its phase three trial. We got a safety signal and we pulled the plug. Within 72 hours, the program is gone. So that was the starting of the unraveling of a lot of things at Biomarin. Now you're on your heels trying to figure out what do I do next? One of the ways Fred thought that we could solve this problem was to go out and acquire something rather quickly. The biggest blunder in those middle years by Fred was the acquisition of Orpred, both the product and a sales force of 72 people. That almost did us in. Boy, Orpred was just a disaster. There was just no way to paint that in any other way. This was never a good idea from the beginning. It was driven by Fred's need to satisfy shareholders. He wasn't listening to advice he was getting from the management team. People were literally afraid to talk to Fred. You're just kind of rolling right over it and ignoring all, the, all of the warning flags. Right after we bought it, within a matter of a couple of months, product that's generic that's going to be priced at far lower price is going to be launched. Suddenly, the bottom fell out of the market. After you've committed to spending hundreds of millions of dollars on this thing, that's a, that's a problem. It was pretty dismal. It was a daunting time, for sure. That really led to what is probably the nadir of Biomarin's existence. In the last 10 months, I've been literally everywhere to talk to people, either from our past or our present. And it's an amazing collection of insights and stories. In my role as the head of product development, I know everything that happened good and bad because I was the fixer. And there was a lot of to fix. It's actually on my way back from my honeymoon when I looked at my Blackberry, my Blackberry at the time, <laughs> and the announcement was made that our CEO at the time, Fred Price, was leaving the company. I immediately called my boss and said, what does this mean? Do I need to find another job? I think the questions in everyone's minds, well, is the company gonna be able to survive this blow? We had an interim CEO, Lou Drapeau. Lou did a great job creating that interval period where we could calm down, 
and prepare for the next phase of biomolecular growth. As much as there was a little bit of relief when Fred left, there was still an incredible amount of strain on the business. A lot of people left. Well, we had a turnover rate in 2004 that was above 25%, which is fine if you're in retail, but in biotech, it's devastating. Our cash burn was at the rate where we really only had enough cash for another nine to 12 months. I thought it was like crazy. <laughs> it was crazy. Good morning, everyone. Today, uh, we're going to follow the uh, recent tradition of having our all-hands meetings. We're going to try to update you on what's happening. Uh, we've had some uh, rather significant things happen in the just recent past, so uh, I'll go over the recent company news. Yeah, I actually don't know exactly how and why we found the church. Well, the early on all hands meetings, we'd actually go to the non-denominational church that is there in Hamilton. I believe that Lou started the all hands meetings, and that was the first time that the employees all gathered together and were actually spoken to and updated as to what was going on with the company. We knew we had to come together and talk to people and to tell them what our plan was. Here's the good, the bad, and the ugly, and here's what we're going to do about it. Seeing our leadership go up there and acknowledge that things can be tough, but we'll, we'll get through it together. People were anxious, and people were leaving. I was worried about whether there might be hostility in the air. I myself, in my heart of hearts, was concerned about Biomarin and my future as well. Everybody was. I remember Dan Mayer channeling Phil Donahue. <laughs> and I do remember Dan taking on the microphone and walking around the audience uh, and making real individual connections with people. Dan was an ideal MC for the All Hands meetings. Now I have to admit, off the bat, I'm going to be full of symbolism, Im imagery, and animation. It's not going to be on the screen, it's all going to be right here. <laughs> Dan really is an icon at the company. His ability to rally a group to have a single path is really unique. We're going to fight back and we're going to step ahead. We're going to win in the long term. It's going to happen bigger and faster than we ever imagined. And it's very exciting. And stepping back and being able to talk about, wow, look where the company's going, look what we're doing. When I say keep it together, the main thing they accomplished was this idea of keep the faith, that we are strong, we do have a strong team here, and we will get through this. People understood that the core of the science involved a mission to help patients, and that passion brought people together. Looking back, it felt like a family business. We have each other's back, and it's that commitment to each other that has helped us overcome some of the challenges. During that time, there was management by committee, and some of those same individuals the company was built upon were now the folks running the company, but unencumbered. So for a period of nine months or so, we had Robert Baffey and Emil Packus, Stu Sweedler, Dan Mayer, Eric Davis, Dan Oppenheimer, Amy Waterhouse, Chris Starr, and especially Lou Drapeau, who held it together. And it's actually pretty remarkable that they accomplished that. It was, I think, the single period in our history that allowed us to springboard where we are today in our 20th anniversary. I can work for a big pharma company, but what happens to the underdog? What happens to the little guy? That's why I'm here. Most pharmaceutical companies don't have a sales force that knows all the patients. We do. That means we actually see the impact of what we do. Patients are not anonymous. There are so few that you will get connected. And I wanted to get people to feel how important they were for not just a few patients, but all the patients with this disease around the world. When we meet patients and see the reality of this patient, it's so hard that it's like you have to help. That was my personal driver and I believe that was a personal driver from a lot of the other lads as well. 
Isabella. Couldn't have been more than maybe six or seven years old. And she came over and tugged on my shirt and said, Dr. O'Neill, uh, thank you for the medicine. And welling up the whole time. And you know, that really personalizes it. It was nice for me to have been so close to the patients because I put a face on all the biology. Whenever somebody in Barmory and hear the patient stories, it reinvigorates you to say, actually, this is the company I'm working for. I'm actually making a difference. I believe what Biomory is doing, and I believe that I'm a very important key to make it happen. What I'm doing today, it may be a tiny, tiny little piece or this one experiment, but it's leading to a, a next big step. Lou Drapeau's the uh, acting CEO. Lou was the finance guy, so he was always watching the budget. He would really rub Emil Kakis the wrong way on some of the penny-pinching sorts of things. Coming into 2005, we're, we're running on fumes. We were struggling a bit. Certainly from a cash perspective, the company was not on, I would say, solid footing. Given the tense environment, we still had the startup mentality, and so we have brought up the topic of an April Fool's joke. April 1st comes along, and you come in in the morning, and here's a memo in your inbox. To all Biomer employees. But we're tightening our belts, we need everybody to chip in. So we need to ration our resources. Uh, here's a stack of bio bucks. And bio bucks were dollars with pictures of all the management team. I think I'm on the $50 bill. So if you go to the copier, you need to print some copies, you know, it's gonna cost you five bio bucks. Or if you need a pen, it's gonna cost you one bio buck. And when you run out of money, you know, you run out of money. Well, it's funny because I think some people didn't get that it was a joke. It looked very official. There was a lot of like, what the hell is this? Very creative and to many folks, it was an obvious April Fool's joke. Unfortunately, one person that didn't get the joke was uh, Emil Kekis. For those of people that know Emil, you know, he, he can be very passionate. Emil reads this thing and he takes it serious and he thinks it's coming from Lou. And he comes out of his office ripping. The first thing he did was walk straight into Lou Drapeau's office in full Hulk mode. Emil storms in, waving the bio buck, saying, what is this crap? We can't do this. Emil didn't take much in stride, so he was ready to wrestle right down to the ground. You got Lou, pretty level-headed guy, just says, Emil, look, look at the calendar. What's, what's today's date? You know, as soon as I heard that story, I was like, maybe I should start packing some of my things just in case. That April Fool's joke caused such a stir. It struck a nerve, I think. And the investigation started immediately. I know Mark Wood at the time was on the hunt. Well, when you're doing it, it's, it's fun, right? It's afterwards when you realize you've done it, you're like, oh crap, uh, was that really a good idea? To this day, even I don't know who actually did it. It's a fantastic April Fool's joke. There were a couple of us that knew who the individual perpetrator was. We were sworn to secrecy. The secret was well kept for years. Now that Dan's assured me of the statute of limitations. And all right, I did it. With the string of bad news around that time, maybe just some laughter was, was the right medicine. So the first 10 years are characterized by dysfunctional CEOs. Underneath them were CFOs, Bill Anderson, Lou Drapeau, that helped us get through this difficult period. If I can characterize this core of individuals, Robert, Eric, and Josh, and some others, management by committee, as being the soul of our first 10 years, JJ's been the soul of our second 10 years. The rock bottom was probably 2005. When I joined in 2005, what they didn't tell me was that Biomarin only had money enough for two more pay periods. The acting CEO at that time asked his lieutenant to say, who doesn't need a paycheck? Uh, we didn't have a CEO at the time. Merrill Lynch telling us we should dilute the company. It was a very tumultuous time. My first year and a half here at Biomarin, I had three CEOs. There was Fred Price, Lou Drapeau, and then J.J. Bienname came on board. I think a lot of people thought J.J. was going to come with the intention of selling the company. He's going to turn it around and sell it. You know, that's what J.J. does. Actually, never. never. <laughs> you never thought about selling it? No. Uh, no, seriously. It never really crossed my mind to come in to sell the company. So the time of J.J. gave us all confidence within the company. We were going to survive the white water. It was potentially a great company and that they were great, passionate people who could you know, be part of a, a future. JJ was exactly, exactly what we all needed and wanted. 
tremendous things happened in May that were, you know, fundamentally changing for the company. JJ on his first day signed the, the Serrano deal. The day I joined the company, there had been negotiations that had been going on for a while between Bar Marine and Serrano. There was a $25 million upfront payment here and the company was running out of cash. That influx of cash helped a long way. We lived to fight another day. I was diagnosed at the age of four and they told my parents that I wasn't going to live past the age of 10. Back then, there really were the treatments for MPS6. With Naglazine, two-thirds of our patients in general are outside the U.S. We said, how are we going to get it to all the patients around the world? We have no infrastructure. didn't have a single commercial person on board. We just hadn't done that kind of global outreach. There were negotiations between Balmarine and Genzyme to have Genzyme acquire Naglazine rights outside of the U.S. The terms were crappy. We went and talked to JJ and we sat down and we said, here's the deal, this is it, we can't get anything better. And he said, you know, let's leave it. We're going to do this on our own. So when we walked out of the room on the Nagazone deal, that was a lot of fun. To be able to just say to them, forget it, we're out, we'll go on our own merry way and, and have, have done so very successfully, that was a lot of fun. That moment of saying no to Genzyme was the moment of freedom for us in a way. You know, JJ had the guts to kind of roll the dice on commercializing that independently. The folks who make the stuff, if, you know, a lot of them are like me. They have a lot of ownership of it. And it was really frustrating in some ways with Aldurazyme knowing that, well, we were making it, but Genzyme was selling it. So that idea of Naglazyme all coming to us, I think that really made a lot of us light up. When we made the decision, it was kind of a bold move because uh, we indeed had to build the whole organization from scratch. We were, you know, kind of pioneers at the company. We were, you know, zooming around the world, uh, connecting dots, making relationships, getting patients treated. One of the largest triumphs for the company over the years has been the successful globalization of the business. What was new about Biomarin was having a totally blank slate to work with. We're going to make it ours. The European operations were started with uh, two guys in a coffee shop in London. Guy likes to tell the story that when he first started, we didn't have an office, and that he was hired in one of the pubs in London, and he would go there during the day because he had free internet service. <laughs> didn't have a company laptop, didn't have a company phone, yeah, so communication was a little bit difficult. So I found an internet cafe, and from that internet cafe, we did our business. And as we were getting larger, it was really painfully apparent that we needed infrastructure and offices. In those really early days, it was being really flexible and adaptable. And I think that spirit, it's that flexible and adaptable spirit, that's part of the DNA of the company. At the time at Biomarine, um, made me the offer. And I was the first physician prescribing and treating commercially Naglazyme. We now have 14 people in medical affairs in Latin America. So it's Mexico, Central America, Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia. From San Francisco to Dublin to London to Warsaw to Istanbul. To Argentina and Uruguay, Paraguay, Chile and Brazil. We built all of that, that global delivery system, that personalized medicine, and we do that in every country around the world. It was 2008 when I joined Baumrin. I was the number one person there. Now we have about 30-some people. You have China, you have India, the most populous countries in the world. I mean, it's all within Asia Pacific. Fast forward 10 years, and you know, now you have a commercial organization in Dublin that is selling product throughout Europe and the Middle East. We have a manufacturing plant in Ireland. Well, it's just a fantastic story. It's been the most exciting roller coaster ride ever. We describe PKU as a vicious cycle of decline. PKU is a brain threatening disorder. Excess phenylalanine goes into the brain 
and it causes damage. My body can't break down a protein called phenylalanine, so I have to eat things that don't have as much protein in it. We have to watch what they eat. We have to weigh and measure the phenylalanine in their food. When my fuel levels are high, I usually feel like grumpy. I don't really pay attention to like anything. These patients have symptoms of anxiety, depression, agoraphobia, mood issues, focus, difficulty completing daily tasks. In 2005, the general sense of the medical community was the therapy for PKU is dietary therapy. This was an ultra-orphan disease that didn't have a lot of resources and funding available. The medical geneticist said to us, and I will not forget, that there is a new drug treatment, and it is the first treatment ever available for PKU. We launched Kuban at the end of 2007. For the first time, there was some hope of something different. We looked at Kuban, and we thought, you know, what we want to provide to our children is the best future they could have. It's been amazing what has happened, I think, since BioMarin entered the PKU space. We've had new treatments, we've had innovation, we've had a renewed interest in research. BioMarin had always thought about if we could potentially reacquire the global rights to Kuvan. Fast forward to 2015, on October 1st, we were relaunching a drug in over 60 markets around the world. The ultra-orphan, rare disease focus, it's who we are. The progress we have made is simply stunning. We are definitely driven by science in the decisions we make at every step of the development of a molecule. Hank Fuchs he came in in 09 and with a, almost a Herculean challenge to replace Amel. What I saw here were a couple of really intriguing things. First of all, I saw a commitment to helping patients who are seriously in need. I saw a management team that had a lot of experience and success, and many of whom were friends from years and years ago. I knew Hank back at Genentech. Extremely bright guy. When uh, Emil decided to move on and start Ultragenics, then I needed a chief medical officer. He turned me down. And then he called me later, fortunately. And that began the match that was made in heaven for me. We see Hank Fuchs coming in, and we could see that it was time really to move on different diseases, different perspectives. The first thing we needed to dig into and move forward was really Vimazim in the clinic. When I joined the company, we had not treated anybody with Vimazim. With my particular type, Mark UA, it would affect, you know, the bones, the joints, the organs. In my mind, that was never going to change. It was only going to progress and, you know, get worse. I told him that we got to get Vimazim developed and uh, we got to get it approved. So it was a big decision to take Vimazim into phase three. And he made some important decisions right off the bat in terms of dose and schedule, and it's approved. That was a tremendous moment because it meant that the work that we'd done was robust and on target. Now, with this feminism treatment, it's given a lot of hope to me, and here's this opportunity for it to completely change everything. Personally, I think that's awesome. Vimazim, of course, was my baby. And to see that go through the process, the excitement, the buzz was monumental. It's extremely inspiring and makes you realize why you come to work every day. I just want to say thank you because there's only 3,000 people with more QA in the world. It was BioMarin, they're changing lives. I'm really very proud of that effort because it's the first product that came out of BioMarin research. That's created a wonderful legacy in being able to do our own innovative research. And you know, the last chapter of the book, I've already decided, is going to be called The Secret Sauce. After all of our ups and downs over 20 years, why are we still here? and how did we make it through? And what's that secret sauce? There are a lot of reasons why BioMarin should not be around today. I believe that there's a lot to learn from this story for anyone looking to put together a successful organization. Why were we successful? You know, why is it that when we ran into big roadblocks, we didn't just give up? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm pushing 100 interviews now. 
all of them answered the same. And the answer was, I'm here because of the people. All the fundamental experiences of Biomarin really can be summed up by saying we made it, we persevered, and it was because of the core people that were there all along. We were launching them as a, in Europe, but there was a lot of things that had to be worked out, and not a single distribution center. But rather than being intimidated by that, that was just a fantastic challenge. It was a milestone move, actually, because uh, all of our manufacturing used to be in the States. I'm on the great Irish tour. We hear about this facility at Shambali that's coming up for sale, and I come into this beautiful facility, and I'm just struck by, this is just what we need. And even JJ was like, I'm not giving you any money to buy another plant. <laughs> JJ, the board, came around to my way of thinking. We were fortunate enough to get a good deal on a state-of-the-art plant from Pfizer. Uh, that was a risky venture, if you will. It was tied to the success of Bimazin as a global business. I was there on day one with Robert and Shambali when it was still owned by Pfizer. It was June 11, I remember clearly. We gathered together in the canteen. So it was Robert Baffey and then Mayor. I do remember that morning. There was quite a lot of trepidation in the room, a lot of anxiousness, but a lot of eagerness to know who these two boys in town were. And I think the two of them together just had a very, very powerful message. The takeaway was, if you remember nothing else, we're the company to help sick kids. Well, I think the original announcement was that nobody would get a job with Biomarin. I needed in hiring the initial core people to have some continuity. You know, there's like 120, 130 people inside, and Byron said, you know what, we only want to keep on 12. We get a lot of grief for calling ourselves the original 12. If I were the 12 apostles, I don't think we meet that criteria now, if I'm honest. They've been tested by fire. They built this facility, and before it was turned on, it was sold to some young company in California. I had never heard of Byron. I had never heard of MPS, I'd never heard of Morpheus Syndrome. They came with some trepidations, much like in the early Biomarin days, where we didn't know what was coming around the next curve. And that was a thing, it was a leap of faith. I didn't know what it was going to be, but I knew it was going to be good. And five years later, we're on the way to being great. I've been involved in three other startups prior to Biomarin but this has probably been the most aggressive ones that we've ever done. You gotta do it faster. And this is why you gotta do it faster. It's not for me, it's not for money. These patients need this product as quick as you can get it. We had a really nice surprise visit from a, a I think it was a Bimazim patient. He was so thankful for the quality of life. He said, I could have never traveled like this without uh, Bimazim. Oh, this is great, this is why we're doing it, you know? <laughs> We developed this site in the last five years from having 12 people up to over 450 people on site here today. It's the growth, the pace of growth here is, is fantastic. We've gone from being a single product facility when we started to becoming a multi product facility now. So we're talking about manufacturing Vimazin, Brainura, and we're talking about Neglu for another MPS therapy. Biomarin now is expanding globally. Now we've got a footprint in Europe, so we are now providing services to the European market and to Asia because of this facility. Gene therapy is probably the most exciting thing that's happening right at the moment in, in Biomarin. Well, if you listen to JJ, he was asked about how we're going to manufacture this product. He said, we're building a facility in Nevada and we're building one in Chambéry. At my own laboratory, me and a few people, and to be able to lead a little group and go after a disease and treat it was terribly exciting. But I thought if we could get the research team to form like little groups led by a scientist and a few people, they could recreate that feeling I had working in my own lab. People feel that they can do anything that allows them to contribute to a future medicine for somebody who deserves it. The idea that you're the one that has to make this go, there's no one else, and you can do it. As a scientist, it's really wonderful because I've never been told no to anything that, that I need to pursue a risky line of investigation, as long as I can support that with, with good logical arguments and data. The capacity to influence 
decisions and capacity to be able to shape what we have here has been incredible for me. It's a different mindset. I feel like I can actually behave as a business owner and know that if I can bring that idea out in a successful way, that will probably make it happen. I'm designing my own experiments. I'm pursuing the research that I want. And I know when you do that, your whole career suddenly seems meaningful. There's no midlife crisis after that. When I came to college, I was thinking, what can I study or major in that I'd be successful in? I'm 28 years old now, and I'm studying sports administration, as well as I'm a student equipment manager working for the University of Louisville football team. I love being able to say that I'm a part of a team. To be on the sideline watching the game just makes it that much more special. No one really thought that I would make it to this age. I was diagnosed with MPS1 when I turned three. Yes, I had a rough childhood. Yes, I had so many surgeries. Yes, I was part of a trial. But yes, I have grown up. I'm living my life to the fullest and trying to live, aka, a normal life. It's amazing to see how far I've come to where I'm at today. Barmerin's a rare bunch. Dr. Kack is, I'm very fortunate to have him as a doctor and a close friend too. I have a great support system. I have an amazing girlfriend. She loves baseball. We're both Texas Rangers fans. Her name's Sylvia. I told her I'm not proposing until I have a college degree and I have a full time paying a job that can afford the ring. <laughs> when I graduate, I'm hoping to work in professional baseball for the Cincinnati Reds. The Reds could use my help because they're the worst team in the baseball, but they have the potential of being a great team. I never ever quit in something that I start. I think we all get called to what we're doing. Um, you know, it's it's part of who we are, and the. The results are phenomenal when you see these children. I just passed 10 years being at Biomarin. It has gone by in a flash. Um, and still a lot of those same old friends from before. Whenever you smile and laugh a lot with the people you work with, it's a good sign, right? I started in 2009 at Biomarin, and I love it. We offer hope. Sometimes I go to meetings and there are parents there, and they would come in and say thank you that it has really helped their child and that's what I like to hear, right? That's what it's all about. It's something bigger than yourself and part of that is helping out these children who basically have genetic wild cards. They didn't do anything to get these diseases. They're innocent in all this and it's about Biomarin to go and help those patients. First I want to thank Biomarin for that because I think it's imperative that employees understand that what they are doing at Biomarin is changing lives for families around the world. Uh, they're not producing a product. They're, they're truly finding tomorrows. And I can reflect back on the moment when we were diagnosed. We had none. When we look at what we're doing here, it is really building a legacy that will last for a long time. We've really created something here that's really special in terms of our culture, our people, how we work together, how we deliver. Um, and I really feel a strong part of that. And what I've learned from being at Biomarin, besides some scientific terms, is just continue fighting. You know, some of us have been with the company for over 10, 15 years now, but to remember uh, how you got here, the, the dance with who brought you. We're able to take on any new challenge and say, there's a new speed bump or a new Everest in front of us, and we'll say, we'll figure it out. It's incredibly exciting to imagine that somewhere at a desk across the way from us right now, a scientist is thinking about a problem, and he's going to bring, or she is going to bring, all of the skill and knowledge and experience of this place to bear on in discovering the next Vimizim or the next Brignura or the next gene to put into a human's body. It is biomarine to be open to new technology. What we do is always a first. We're always at the forefront.